Thanks to Rocket Money for sponsoring this video. Right now, for some reason, I just feel really great. Hey, welcome back to Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy, and let's talk about all of the Easter eggs references and little things you might have missed in the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special. I've also got a few theories on Mantis's big bombshell reveal and how all of this can affect Guardians Volume 3 and bringing Gamora back onto the team. But first, let's break down this special. Yeah, why was it so weird? And why does it look different from all the movies? And how are Peter and Mantis related? And I mean, what the hell is going on? Well, Doug, the reason it looks different is because this is in the style of the old-time Christmas specials on TV, where a celebrity like Bing Crosby would be in a house and entertaining other celebrity guests as they stop by. Even the box of Kevin Bacon seemed like a callback to this. Rick Jones! Christmas specials are always a little goofy and have a ridiculous premise and are filled with Christmas music. So in this special, check, check, check. The Easter egg starting in the opening credits where the special presentation graphic has a shortened version of the Marvel theme. And the Marvel Studios logo always begins with comics before transitioning into scripts and then movie images to show that the comics are the source material for the films. So the comics in this episode are from all Marvel Comics Christmas issues, including this one, X-Men number 143, where Kitty Pride has to fight off an Angari demon in the X-Mansion while she's left alone at Christmas. Now the Angari are the same demons that served Wanda in Multiverse of Madness. The song that opens and ends the special is called Fairy Tale of New York, and it is a massively popular Christmas song in the United Kingdom. It's about people locked in a drunk tank singing Christmas carols and then the cops join in and everybody has a Merry Christmas. A song about unruly misfits making their own Christmas cheer is exactly what happens in this episode. Now, the opening flashback to me looks like it was rotoscoped. This is an animation style where artists drew over filmed footage. It was popularized by Ralph Bakshi in the 1970s, and there's actually a whole Lord of the Rings movie in this style that people have just forgotten about, even though it's great. Hey, Doug, do you want to order food from that place we enjoyed food from last time? I can't. I'm broke. What do you mean you're broke? You make twice as much money as me. And you're a dog. I know, but all my money seems to just disappear, and I am so small. Well, what did your Rocket Money say? Oh, I don't have enough money to buy rockets. No, Doug. Rocket Money, the mobile app. Rocket Money shows you where your money goes, and they're the sponsor of this video. Rocket Money is so easy to use. I input all my financial details, and I found out that I was spending $50 a month on subscription services that I totally forgot about. Like for this one video, I had to research a movie that was on Showtime, so I signed up for a free trial. Totally forgot about it. Plus, and this is my favorite part, they can negotiate your bills to lower the cost. They saved me 20% on my internet bill, so I upgraded a premium, and Rocket Money paid for itself right away. That's why more than 3.4 million members trust Rocket Money to help them with their finances. Okay, so I can save money? So then I can spend more money? No, 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 not at all. Rocket Money helps you to plan out a budget for yourself, and it lets you know when you've exceeded that budget. And with Rocket Money Premium, you get free credit score checks, unlimited budgeting, and tons of other features that will help you invest in your future. So to try out Rocket Money for free and unlock more features with premium, head to rocketmoney.com slash screen crush or click the link in the description below. Now back to the Easter eggs. When Yondu enters, he says, What in the fires of Ogard y'all think you doing? Now the colors of Ogord were first mentioned here in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. And the colors of Ogord? will never flash over your grave. So in that movie, Sylvester Stallone plays Takar Ogord, leader of the Ravagers, and the collars of Ogord refer to the funeral lights that we see at the end of the movie. Yeah! 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 Still gets me. I love the fine details in this animation, like how the tree is decorated with spare parts from the Ravager ship. So the episode begins with Yondu apparently ruining Christmas, raising the stakes for Peter to have his first real Christmas since he left Earth. Mantis mentions, He's so sad about Gamora being gone. But I thought Gamora died in Avengers Infinity War. She did, that's right. But remember, in Avengers Endgame, a version of Gamora from 2014 traveled into 2023, where she briefly met the Guardians. <laughs> Now, while this version of Gamora did turn away from Thanos, she lacks all the backstory with the Guardians, and so she didn't join the team in Thor Love and Thunder. In the present, we find out that the Guardians bought Nowhere from the Collector. Now, you remember that Nowhere is the severed head of a Celestial that was featured heavily in the first movie. This also housed the headquarters of the Collector that was damaged in Guardians 1. And Thanos devastated this entire place in Infinity War. Reality is often disappointing. So the Guardians purchasing Nowhere is actually huge for a number of reasons. One, it means that the Collector is alive because they bought it from him. Two, it means that the Guardians have saved up all the money they made gigging around the galaxy. 
And maybe whoever it is will give us a little cheddar cheese for our effort. Which isn't the point. Which isn't the point. And now they've bought a place that is a bustling galactic hub. Now, nowhere is actually a huge industry because people mine the brain fluid of the dead celestial. Got a theory on how that ties in with Mantis that I'll go into just in a bit. So this places the Guardians in a grown-up authoritative position. We see Peter signing forms and being an administrator. He's all grown up like Lando Calrissian. Supply problems of every kind. I've had labor difficulties. <laughs> Now, in the comics, Nowhere actually becomes the headquarters of the Guardians of the Galaxy. Just like in the movies, it's a bustling place with a bar named Starlin's, named after Jim Starlin, the creator of Thanos, Adam Warlock, and most of the more famous Marvel cosmic characters. And he has a cameo in Avengers Endgame right here. And the head of security at Nowhere is Cosmo the Space Dog, who is a member of the Guardians in the comics, and I'm thrilled has now kind of joined the team. Yeah, but a talking dog seems cliche to me. But you're... Never mind. In the comics, Cosmo was a dog sent into space by the Russians back in the 1950s, who was then bombarded with cosmic rays and got telepathic and telekinetic abilities. Cosmo was based on Laika, a dog the Russians sent into space, who was actually the first creature from Earth to travel into the stars. Oh, I bet that puppy got a real big parade when she came back to Earth. Sure. In the special and in Guardians 3, she's voiced by Maria Bakalova, who you might remember from the second Borat movie. How many other girls are gonna live in here with me? Now, after Nowhere was destroyed, we saw Cosmo escape and then licking the Collector's wounds. Gross. And in the show What If, we see her going back to Earth with the Ravagers. Then some aliens sing Peter a hilarious misunderstanding Christmas song. Now the band here is called the Old 97s, and notice how the lead singer can do this weird windmill thing with his elbow joint, and then a crowd member decides to copy it. One of the lyrics is, One sought to be a dentist. Which of course is referring to Hermie, the elf who only wanted to be a dentist from the Rudolph Christmas special. Do you mind telling me what you do wanna do? Well sir, someday I'd like to be a a dentist. Now Groot looks very interesting in this special. He's no longer a teenager and he's also not the long, tall tree like his dad was. What do you mean? Well, the first Groot actually died in Guardians 1 and this Groot is his offspring. Groot's dead and this has been a whole new Groot this entire time. Oh my god. So this Groot might actually be full grown and just wider than his pa was. Or I thought this kind of looked like a man in a suit with some CGI work done in the face. Maybe they did this to save money. Let me know if you think this is a Groot suit down in the comments below. As Mantis and Drax are overlooking nowhere, we see the bar where the Guardians bet on lizards racing and had one too many. Why did it ask to get made? Now I know it's the same bar because the lizard neon sign outside matches the same species as the one they were betting on back in Guardians 1. Drax mentions, you ate the entire bowl of Zargnuts in the commissary? And this was the snack that Drax was eating in Infinity War. Then Mantis drops the big reveal that she is actually Ego's daughter and Peter's half-sister. But how is this possible? Well remember, Ego literally and metaphorically spread his seed throughout the galaxy, trying to create offspring that would allow him to expand. Yondu brought these kids to him over the years, and after the expansion didn't take with them, this happened. Now, in the movie, Mantis just says that Ego found her and kept it secret that she was actually his daughter. Now, I think this was always James Gunn's intention and not some retcon, because adding a sister reveal on top of all the emotional baggage of the second movie would have just been too much in one film. I think that what happened was Ego collected Mantis, the expansion didn't work, but then Ego held onto her because she helps him sleep. It's also fitting because the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie is about these misfits learning to be friends, and in the second movie, we see that they have become a family, even taking care of baby Groot like some adopted aunts and uncles. So, Mantis being Peter's literal family fits in perfectly with the overall story that James Gunn is telling. Drax remembers all the times that Peter has talked about Kevin Bacon, like in Guardians 1. A great hero named Kevin Bacon. And then later, this was brought up in Infinity War. Earth's mightiest heroes. Like Kevin Bacon? He may be on the team, I don't know. And of course, later in the movie as well. Not in the, it's not like in Footloose, the movie? Exactly like Footloose. Now, the whole plot of this episode about aliens kidnapping an actor because they think he's the character that he plays is very reminiscent of one of the all-time greatest comedies ever made, Galaxy Quest. We pretended. We lied. Aww. It's also a plot lifted from one of the worst Christmas movies ever made that I'll talk about in just a few minutes. So then we cut to Kevin Bacon on Earth talking to his real life wife, Kira Sedgwick, who voices herself on this special. They travel to Earth using the same warp tech that we've seen in other movies that creates a hexagonal pattern in space time. Wait, hexagonal hexagons like a hive, like the bees, like Mephisto! No, not the bees! Not the bees! And if you're a big fan of Not the Bees, then maybe you'd like our Not the Bees t shirt for sale at the Screen Crush merch store at shopzeroedition.com. And now we have two hot new items that I am really excited about. There's the shirt that summarizes when Harry met Sally as a Star Wars crawl. Yes! 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 
and our very first piece of Doug merch for a limited time. You can get this Doug Christmas tree ornament where he has a single antler like Max, the Grinch's dog. Check out our link in the description to get yours today. Now back to Guardians. So the music playing in this scene is I Wish It Was Christmas Today, and the original version of this was performed every year on Saturday Night Live by Horatio Sands, Jimmy Fallon, Chris Kattan, and Tracy Morgan. I wish it was Christmas today. So then they go to the streets of LA in front of the Chinese theater. Now this is where many, many Marvel movies have had their red carpet premieres, and it's also where Happy Hogan almost died in Iron Man 3. There are a few obvious Easter eggs in this scene, and one really obscure one. So just like we saw in Times Square in the show Hawkeye, there are people dressed as popular heroes having their photos taken. We see Zorro, Captain Jack Sparrow, Ant-Man, Captain Marvel, Black Widow, Thor, and of course, Mantis thinks that she sees... They also see a GoBot, which is also kind of a joke. See, these are all generic knockoffs of real heroes, and GoBots are a knockoff of the Transformers. Er, GoBot fandom gonna come after you. Oh yeah? Come after me, GoBot fandom. I can handle both of you. And the obscure Easter egg here is a movie poster for a film starring Kingo from The Eternals. Remember, Kingo is a movie star that spans generations. I'm part of the greatest dynasty in the history of Bollywood. On their search for Kevin Bacon, they go to a bar where the bartender is Fiola Borg, who was in James Gunn's The Suicide Squad. Now, I loved how this special actually expanded on Mantis because we haven't actually gotten much time with her up until now. Little details like how she laps her drink with her tongue, similar to how an insect would do this. And later, we see that she is an actual badass who is like super fast and agile, kind of like a bug. But she's also a skilled fighter who incorporates her powers into these fights. <laughs> Now, when this guy asks Drax to dance, he says, Dancing is for people who are pathetic. Which is a callback to this moment. I am a dancer. Gamora is not. You just need to find a woman who is pathetic. Like you. Mantis also says that there are tens of thousands of people on Earth, again, playing with the special theme of misunderstandings. The band misunderstands Christmas, and she and Drax misunderstand Kevin Bacon's true purpose in life. Now, Mantis robs this lady for her star map. Now, these are real, and they're sold throughout LA to tourists. They're things where tourists can look at a map and drive around and look at people's houses just because they're famous. It's weird. On the map, we see Arnold Schwarzenegger, Queen Latifah, and two actors who starred in James Gunn's The Suicide Squad, John Cena and Margot Robbie. James Gunn even said that Margot Robbie is his favorite actress that he's ever worked with. And now, I guess none of these actors can be cast in the MCU because, like Kevin Bacon, they are also just plain movie stars who exist in this universe. Although, Kevin Bacon is kind of already in the MCU. He was in X-Men First Class, which was a prequel to the Fox X-Men films. But the Multiverse of Madness showed that Patrick Stewart's Professor X is in the Marvel Multiverse, meaning that Kevin Bacon's Sebastian Shaw does exist at least somewhere in that universe, which can only mean that Kevin Bacon in this universe and in our universe is the son of the mutant Sebastian Shaw and that he is a latent mutant in the MCU. Come at him, GoBots fans. Thanks, buddy. High five. One thing I love about this is that Kevin Bacon apparently just loves Christmas. His house is decked out in Christmas decorations and lawn ornaments, and he's really enjoying Santa Claus Conquers the Martians. Now, this is a terrible, terrible movie. It recently made number 11 on Matt Singer's all-time worst Christmas movies list, which you can read on ScreenCrush.com. So the movie is about Martians kidnapping Santa Claus so he will bring Christmas to Mars, which is also the plot of this special. But some of the Martians also want to kill Santa, like how Mantis and Drax end up hating Kevin Bacon. Kevin Bacon's address is 1988, the same year that Peter Quill was kidnapped and taken to Earth. So that was the year of Peter's last Christmas, and Kevin Bacon will now deliver his next Christmas. It all fits well thematically. As they try to capture him, the song playing is a very appropriate tune, called I Want an Alien for Christmas by the Fountains of Wayne, because from their perspective, Kevin Bacon is an alien. Now on the trip, they drop a couple pop culture references, including the Fonz from Happy Days. Hey. And of course, Kevin Bacon's most famous role in Footloose. That was a character that I played, Red McCormick in the movie, Footloose. Which Peter talked about in Guardians 1 and in Infinity War. A great hero named Kevin Bacon. He teaches an entire city full of people with sticks up their butts that dancing, well, it's the greatest thing there is. And Footloose, the movie? Exactly like Footloose. Is it still the greatest movie in history? But they also talk about how Kevin Bacon was in Friday the 13th Part 2 at the very start of his career when he died pretty quickly. And after Mantis tells him to act like a hero, he says, Hello, I'm the Batman. And you'll remember that Fastos' son was also a fan of DC Comics. Dad, that's Superman! Uh, Dad, that's Superman! And of course, that movie also has a Batman reference. Oh, valet, like Alfred in Batman. 
I think this is a really cool way to show that the MCU, though fantastical, also shares a lot of our superhero pop culture. Peter gets a surprise magical Christmas, which is actually ruined by the Kevin Bacon reveal. It's kind of weird that Kevin Bacon's so freaked out by this, because wouldn't he know that the Guardians helped save Earth? I mean, maybe not, but like this moment would freak out anyone. That's a talking raccoon. I'll kill you! On the ship, Kevin Bacon has a change of heart and realizes he wants to share his love of Christmas with nowhere. Good thing we know how much he loves Christmas from the decorations earlier in the episode. Craglin also explains the fin on his head. That is a device for controlling a flying arrow. Now you'll remember that this was Yondu's fin that he used to control his arrow. And Craglin mentions that he can't quite control the arrow yet, but we did see him practicing in one of the Guardians of the Galaxy post credit scenes. This is also neatly setting up something for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, when I'm sure that Craglin will finally be able to master the arrow to save the day. And then Christmas comes to nowhere. Groot gets a Game Boy, a big upgrade from the cheap Tiger handheld game he played in Infinity War. Put that game down. You rot your brain. Giving out data tech as a gift is a lot like when Craglin gave Peter a Zoom to replace his Walkman. It's called a Zoom. It's what everybody's listening to on Earth nowadays. Nebula gives Rocket a very special gift. Lucky's arm? Which, of course, is a callback to this. Okay, how much for the arm? Which was actually a callback to this. There's one more thing we need to complete the plan. That guy's arm. And then this. That dude there. I need his prosthetic leg. In Falcon the Winter Soldier, actually, we saw that Bucky's arm was very easy to detach. <laughs> Now this is also pretty sweet because Nebula and Rocket were the only two people of the Guardians left alive during the blip. So she would know him particularly well and would know this gesture would mean a lot. Nebula dancing is like so intense and familiar. She is definitely that like lady at the club who just wants to do her own thing and feel every kind of music with rigorous intensity. Cosmo gives a dead lizards from the gambling bar. It's a good girl who's a good girl. Okay, that's enough about Cosmo. And you're a good boy, high five. The dolls that Groot gives away depict the events of the episode, and by far, my favorite is Kraglin holding a Kraglin, holding a Kraglin, holding a Kraglin. I wonder if these figures were actually inspired by an event that happened to James Gunn on the set of Guardians Volume 3. Every day, James Gunn tweeted that some mysterious person was leaving a different Rick and Morty figurine at his desk. And of course, we see that little figurines also have an emotional resonance with the characters in the show. Peter made a little figurine for Yondu as a Christmas present and started his habit of keeping little dolls on his console. In fact, we can see this one here. This adds a lot of heart into the ending of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1, when Yondu opens up the orb and sees that Peter gave him a treasure troll. And this special also shows us how Peter first got his guns. And guys, listen, I got misty during that Mantis reveal. It's just, a, you know, like, Peter lost his mom, his dad tried to end the universe and, like, suck all the life force out of his body, Gamora's gone. He has no one, but now he has a sister, and it's really sweet that they finally found each other. Now, this is also interesting in a theory crafting kind of way, because it means that Mantis is also half celestial. Like I said earlier, she doesn't have the celestial power to create the expansion like Peter did, and Peter's powers were taken away when Ego died. But I'm wondering if Mantis could be the key to reactivating Peter's powers. Like, does Mantis even have her powers just because she's Ego's kid. And remember, now they are headquartered on Nowhere, a place that is literally filled with dead celestial brain fluid. I'm wondering if, in Guardians 3, Mantis will be able to establish a connection between Peter and this celestial brain fluid that will help to reignite his powers, essentially creating a new Ego the Living Planet for Peter to draw his strength from. Now, we've made a video recently about how Celestials are made up of vibranium and how Kang might be trying to create his own celestial armor to conquer the universe. If this is true, then it means that Peter and the Guardians could play a unique role in this story if Peter gets his powers back. He could be the only Celestial who is on the side of the heroes and the key to stopping Kank, which would be great after this stupid face actually caused the blip. Hey Doug, did you figure out what you want for lunch yet? Nah, my rocket money budget said I was spending way too much on takeout, so I just brought some kibble from home. Hey, good for you. High five. Well, that's all the Easter eggs we found, but if you guys found any, let me know in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe and smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.